Thank you so much. Please help me welcome our next panelist, Mr. Sunil Nair, on the dais. And while he takes his position, let me introduce him to you. Mr. Sunil Nair is the CTO of SPAR India. Mr. Sunil is a result-oriented technology leader with more than 22 years of experience in retail domain across various international geographies. His specialities include leadership in technology for both offline and online business models. He has been the driving force behind major business process transformations that have delivered cost reductions, efficiency gains, agility, and competitive advantage across business with experience spanning across different verticals like food and grocery, apparels, and textiles, furniture and furnishing, and consumer durables. Please help me welcome our next panelist for this session, Mr. Kaushik Day, the General Manager and Head of BI Analytics Ericsson on the dais. And while he takes his position, please help me introduce him to you. Mr. Day, as I just mentioned, is a General Manager of Ericsson India Global Services Private Limited and heads the Business Intelligence Analytics practice in Ericsson, where he is responsible for delivery of global analytics projects, sales en enabling and solutioning, competency in development and innovation initiatives in the domain of data science, and machine learning, big data, and BI technologies. He has an experience of 18 years across diverse projects in consulting, system integration, and product development roles across America, Europe, and South Asian regions representing companies like IBM and Ericsson. His division plays a pivotal role in the digital transformation group of Ericsson, enabling transformative solutions across telco and IoT customers around the globe. Please help me our last panelist for this session, Mr. Shomnath Chatterjee. On the dais, please. And while he takes his position, allow me to introduce him. Mr. Shomnath Chatterjee is a vice president with Capgemini and heads the Kolkata Center. He is a member of the Global Utility Sector Council of Capgemini and is responsible for supporting sales and pre-sales activities globally. Mr. Chatterjee heads a center of excellence for utilities in Capgemini, India, popularly known as the Calorie. After completing graduation in, in electrical engineering and masters in instrumentation engineering, both from IIT Kharagpur, Mr. Chatterjee has worked in large multinational assignments in USA, UK, and in Switzerland. Mr. Chatterjee is an active member of NASCOM, CII, and BCCI chambers in Kolkata, and is a board of several other universities. And to chair this session, please help me welcome on the dais Mr. Atul Prakash Agarwal, Founder and Managing Director, APD Software Avenues Private Limited. Mr. Agarwal, a boutique software company, heads the boutique software company and is also the Founder and Managing Director, which provides software development and product engineering services to organizations around the world, especially to technology startups. Mr. Agarwal has more than 25 years of experience in building complex software systems, both in technology and enterprise business domains. Mr. Agarwal, I would kindly uh, proceed on with the session, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the introductions. <clears throat> uh, a very good afternoon to all, all of you. Welcome to this panel, which is on IoT strategy and the associated risks and rewards. Uh, by now, uh, I guess you have been kind of scared to death uh, by all the security things that might affect you while you are even you know, listening to the panel. And our job right now is to scare you further to tell you how your toaster and your washing machine and your refrigerator is going to scare you further. So uh, uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel. Unfortunately, a little skewed. We have three service providers and one in consumer. But hopefully, we will be able to give you some real life cases on uh, IoT, uh, some how they and, and, the, and the, how they have been IoT projects and how they've been implemented. I'm going to introduce the topic. I have a small presentation uh, which will set the stage. 
and then I will request each of the panelists to speak, and we'll follow that with, question, uh, with some questions, and finally open it up to the audience. Uh, Ma'am, how are we doing with time? We are okay with one hour, or do we? Okay, alrighty. So let me just uh, start my presentation. We are not going to introduce the topic in great detail. What I instead want to do is kind of set the stage to tell you what is involved in a typical IoT project. Uh, IoT could be as simple as a fridge in your home uh, talking to the, uh, the supplier or the manufacturer. IoT could be engines in aircrafts talking to the, some central location, telling about each and every parameter as the plane flies. But in general, an IoT, is, an IoT architecture is a layered architecture with various components that I will describe briefly. Right at the bottom, you have the devices, which are the things, the Internet of Things, the things which could be ATMs, your mobile phones, which could be video cameras, uh, as I said, uh, drones, engines, you name it. And the, the thing about these things is that they are smart in the sense they have sensors which are able to sense the environment or some performance parameter and, and be able to communicate it to some central location. These smart things are able to talk to each other, typically through networking protocols which are known as personal area networks, which could be Bluetooth, which could be Wi-Fi, and Zigbee, which is found in homes, maybe RFID. Now, typically, when there are a lot of sensors, they don't individually send all their data to a central location. There's a kind of an aggregator in between which collects this data and sends it. Uh, that maybe does some security kind of things, uh, maybe does some protocols, and finally moves the data to, the, uh, to a central location, which could be the cloud, typically. And this communication between the cloud and or a central server is through some wide area networks, which could be cellular network, which could be 4G, 5G, uh, low power networks such as LoRa and so on. Once this data arrives at the cloud, if you are dealing with a lot of sensors, you have some kind of a middleware platform which is used to manage these sensors. Maybe turn one off, maybe uh, figure out which one is faulty and so on. There are a lot of other features which are there in a middleware. There are companies which sell. There are open source systems also like AllJoin, Ka, you name it. And finally, when all this data from the sensors is received, you have to do something useful with it, and that is where the applications come into picture. This is, in a nutshell, a typical architecture of an IoT system. Needless to say, it is complicated. And so once we look at the risks and the rewards, let's start with the risk. Well, you're going to deploy such a system, are the costs justified? Is there a ROI associated with deploying such a system? Once, even if you have deployed this, does your organization have the necessary change management policies in place to change your business processes? If you're not, then you're basically wasting time and effort deploying such a system. Security, you have listened, uh, you have heard quite a bit today. Security, what this system does, it is a networked system. It increases the surface area of attack for any unscrupulous person which gets into your enterprise. You have to secure not only the systems, you have to also secure the data that is being collected. There's a privacy issue. Suppose you are a healthcare application, suppose the IoT is a healthcare application, you don't want the world to know who is suffering from a cardiac problem. Uh, fraud is also a big risk because, say, if, if you look at ATMs as a collection of IoT networks, there's always a chance somebody would go in and do some fraudulent transactions. And there are many other examples. Most IoT is, in, is evolving, and unfortunately, there aren't too many standards. So you did deploy IoT system, IoT system in your enterprise, and then suddenly you find that you want to evolve, and then there's a bottleneck because uh, the new systems or new pieces that you want to bring in place don't talk to each other. Finally, 
physical devices, say your refrigerator, has a lifetime of say five to 10 years, while the associated digital services, say communications, has a lifetime of only a few years. So over a period of time, there's a kind of a mismatch that develops where the existing digital services that are needed to support IoT are not compatible with a physical device. So I'm just highlighting some risks. Our panelists are going to talk about them in more detail. Finally, to give you some idea of the rewards, one thing to understand is the reward is industry or use case specific. You cannot say, oh, if I do IoT, I'll always get something. What you will get has to be decided by you, and it is very, very specific to the use case you had in mind when you decided to implement the IoT system. Obvious, some of the obvious rewards that you can reap, quality, that could be of a service or of a product. You could reduce costs, maybe you do early defect management, you are able to anticipate defects and are able to reduce cost. You can increase the efficiency of your personnel because you can give them uh, various ways to monitor the processes and so on. Productivity can be increased, resource utilization can be increased. You, you can possibly through use of sensors predict when motors in your factory are going to fail. There's much better monitoring if you deploy the sensors at appropriate places, you will get real time information about what is happening. So it gives you better monitoring, you can get alarms, notifications, and so on. And also, you know, once you've deployed IoT kind of a solution, there are new business models possible. If you look at Amazon, Amazon Go, the store is purely you know, sensor and IoT driven, and suddenly they have a way where they can offer you a non-checkout way of visiting a store. And finally, it, it can IoT solutions can help in customer loyalty, and engagement. And obviously the panelists are going to talk more about one or more of these topics. With that, uh, I will request uh, Sobhnath to please uh, uh, give your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Uh, I'll be continuing from where Jaspreet left and what uh, Atul spoke about. Uh, I'll be talking more about on the security side of or a lack of security in IoT today. And it's nothing to be scared about. Um, we are just at the beginning of the journey. To tell you and, and to continue from what Jaspreet says, how many of you think that today uh, the IoT industry is secured and we feel that it is resilient? How many would think that uh, IoT industry is secured? We did a study uh, with about 50 or 100 organizations uh, across uh, who manufactures wearables, smart meters, in industrial manufacturing, automotive, and in average we found that about 33% believe that they are resilient. So 67% believe that they are susceptible to attack. That's the situation which we are in today. Now, Many of you would have gone, gone through these statistics. Uh, there are about, people say, 20 billion connected devices by 2020. Some say 50 billion connected devices. But nevertheless, there will be about 10 billion IoT devices in the enterprise, which would be talking to each other by 2020. Now, two-thirds of the enterprise are expected to in, uh, experience IoT security breach by 2018. In next year or so, two-thirds, two I mean 67% of them will experience an IoT breach. And more than 25% identified enterprise attack would be IoT related. Though we know of this threat, but yet towards IoT security, we just put in 10% of our budget. So there's a huge gap today. This is a survey by KPMG, where they surveyed about 3,100 companies globally and found that half of them have implemented IoT. But out of them, 84% has already experienced a security breach. Cyber attacks cost 4 million to 5 million. Those, those are all data. Other is about 5,000 enterprises surveyed around the world. 85% are or will be deployed on IRT devices, yet just 10% feel confident about securing the, those devices against hacking. So what I want to say here today is if we haven't got hacked, it's just a matter of time 
We are all vulnerable, and Jaspreet had ex explained it in the previous session. Now, why is it so? See, the problem today we have is, when we talk about IIT, we talk about uh, connect any device. It has to be open system. It has to be highly scalable. We have to have rapid deployment. We should do edge analytics on the cloud. When you do all these things and when you do rapidly, there are a few challenges which we didn't look into. One is many of the IoT devices that gets into the enterprise system today do not have the same kind of standards and has been vetted the same way as the traditional systems had been in the past. I talk about it in, few, in subsequent slides. So today it, it leads to a possibility that any internet enabled device, whether it's your TV, whether it's your laptop, printer, or any other appliances can be hacked unknowingly. So we have to treat our TV in the boardroom or our printers the same way as we treat a computer on the network. So, and the second challenge that we have is that traditional security frameworks that we have today may be inadequate for today's IoT. In some cases, these legacy systems typically deployed long before IoTs had come into play and generally they are not readily patched or upgraded to support the modern security controls. So these are two challenges we have, and, and I'll be talking about some of the threats that we see for this. Atul went through this, explained about this, the several layers that we have in IoT. So when we are talking of IoT and security, we should not just talk about device. Device is just tip of the iceberg. There are at least five or six layers, which is about data acquisition, that's the lowermost layer, then data aggre aggregation, then analysis, assignment, and action. So and in, in each of these layers, there are so many applications that talk to each other. So when we are talking about any security in an IoT, it's actually we have to look into end-to-end -end and not just at the end device. So what happens is, if you look at the key challenges, which is on the bar graph by the side, securing access to the endpoint, that's a challenge which almost 60% of the IoT products fail to do. And henceforth, I won't go into all these details. We can do it during the discussion. Then another problem that's ha serious and we are not really dealing about it is lack of uh, privacy policy about uh, data security. Today, many of us use Fitbits, but do we get into a contract with the agency on how the data will be used, to whom will they share with? Very few. I know a friend of mine who lives in uh, an apartment in Kolkata. He said that when he had booked his ticket from, uh, through mobile for an 8 p.m. movie at 7.30, and, and he lives in Highland Park, if you know, and there's a movie hall just outside Highland Park. At 7.30, he gets a message saying that at 7.30, you better start because your movie starts at 8, and it's a 10 minutes walk for you. Otherwise, you will get late. So at every point in time, all the data that we have, what time he booked the ticket, where does he reside? He's still not left his home. All this data is there in public domain. Other problem we have is today, security is not a core focus for IIT product development. These two bar graphs, I'll just read out what they are. What it talks is about 48% of the uh, projects that we do, they focus about security from the beginning. And only 36% modify their IIT product development process to focus more on security from the early stage. That means that most of the time, or more than half the time, we do our IoT without looking into the security aspect end to end. Other problem is, see, today IoT devices, we many a times use cheaper IoT devices coming from friendly neighborhood or wherever, where there, are, there is a major problem that they are not they do not have a mechanism to remotely patch the connected devices. Why is it so? It may be because they are cheap, they are inexpensive. Two, it may have lack of, they may have lack of expertise to do this. And three is lack of awareness. The, in most of the mobile phones today, we probably, in, at least in iOS or some of the Android version, we do get updates and it gets updated automatically. But not so in IoT devices as of now. Other problem that we have is, again, we do not realize that IoT requires a specialized security skill. If we take example from Tesla, Tesla, when they were testing their vehicle security system, first thing they did was to hire a person called Kirsten Baggett, who is an expert, having worked with Apple, Google, eBay, and Microsoft on 
similar security aspect. So again, when we are doing an IoT project, we must look into how do we have a security person or a security team embedded into it, or we hire the right kind of security experts. Similarly, we can engage our third party to strengthen our security. Like again, taking Tesla example, they went to DEFCOM, which is one of the largest hacking conference in Las Vegas, and hired 30 hackers from there just to test the uh, security features of their vehicle. Similarly, when they roll out any product, they invite hackers and pay hackers to hack into their system. I'll, I'll end here. So what, what I want to say is, uh, when you are looking at any IoT project or a proposition, there are four or five aspects that we need to look into. One is we need to do a risk analysis. Atul talked about cost-benefit analysis, the ROI that we have, but we should also determine the security goals based on the analysis of disruptive threat scenarios. Second is, when we do a design, we should look into the design of the hardware as well as software, because IoT, as I said, it, it's not just a hardware, it's an integration of four or five layers. Third is, follow the secure coding and the best practices. Fifth is, when we are do doing a testing, we must do a rigorous testing, which is not just the end device testing, but also functional testing, penetration testing, and hardware testing. And finally, get an IoT certification with a comp uh, from a competent agency. Now, the situation across today is not that bad. Before I end, I'll just take you through this slide. We are probably at the beginning of the journey. Out of the companies that we uh, surveyed, only 42% companies said that 42% companies do not provide any IoT solutions. So even almost half the companies did not venture into IoT solutions. Out of those who have implemented IoT, 58% of them just offer basic functionality of IoT. 27% offer remote operability and support. And 34% offer performance employment. So probably 34% are the people who have really deployed something which, is, which benefits from IoT. Monetization of IoT, 70% of the people have not really done a monetize, monetization from IoT. They haven't, don't have a gener, revenue generation from the IoT that they have implemented. Integration with third-party solution, almost done. 13% have done integration with IoT solution. If you look at the maturity of the IoT journey, probably today industrial manufacturing, we have heard about industry 4.0. They are probably leading the pack, followed by medical devices. But if you look at others like utilities, which are kind of like art, insurance, and home appliances. I belong to utility industry, and I'll give you two examples uh, to end with. Uh, one, of the, one project that we have done for, for a water company in UK, See, in uh, water, when a leakage happens underground, uh, say 10 feet under the ground, it's very difficult to detect where the leakage has happened or, or even when the leakage has happened until and unless the seepage happens on the top of the soil. But we have devised, we have come out with a device which actually takes the pressure and the flow of the water. And from that, you can do an analytic, analytics and determine where the leakage has happened. Similarly, when you, you have heard about cable burst, cable burst actually doesn't happen all, all of a sudden. There is a gradual increase in temperature. So if you can put a device underground, which actually be, measures the temperature and the temperature rise, then you can very well predict uh, the time when the cable might snap and you can take precautionary action. So I'll, I'll stop over here. There are, there are a lot of examples that we'll discuss during the session and during the question answer. Thanks. Thank you, Somnath. Uh, as you guessed, he talked uh, most about uh, security of uh, IoT systems, but there are various other aspects, both from risk and reward perspective. May I request uh, Deb to please uh, give his presentation? Hello, I don't have a presentation, so maybe I can. So I'll actually, I'm from a you know, sales and marketing background, and I would love to speak the business language, which uh, possibly most of you can easily understand. So he was talking about uh, the uh, company in London of water, where this you know huge amount of water seepage was happening, and they could save millions of you know pounds. And it's not about the issue is happening over there. Tomorrow it will happen over here because water is scarce everywhere. Right? Uh, Any examples? You know what is uh, what what is driving IoT? You know, step back. You know, why do we need IoT? You know, the first thing is there's a disruption happening everywhere. 
If you notice that there are freeways for your speedometers which you can download on your Android phone or iPhone. And if you're sitting on a bike or a vehicle or a, even sometimes an aircraft is taking off, you can actually see the speed of the you know, vehicle. Last week I was at you know, Germany, I was in the taxi. The taxi was driving at 215 kilometers per hour. I recorded it on my Google phone. So it, you can see it on a dashboard, but you can see it on a Google phone. Now what does this mean? That in future when this has become more dependable, close to a centimeter maybe, today it is like up to 10 meters accuracy, right? That speedometer business will go for a toss. It's not there, the business is not there, That's, business is gone. When, if you notice the disruption with the smartphone, so many things have stopped working. You don't need a watch. You're wearing a traditional watch like this. If you, uh, he was talking about Fitbit today. Now if the traditional watch companies could actually, you know, get the Fitbit kind of, you know, the health uh, statistics into the watch, possibly the sale of Fitbit all could be curbed and you could wear the traditional watches, you know. So these are things which is changing the, you know, scenario in the industry today. There are companies like, you know, uh, SH, you know, Schweischer and Herring in, uh, in uh, Germany, who prepare copper wires, very high precision copper wires, right? And I've interacted with this company. What, if you take that wire which they manufacture, turn it across the globe seven times, the drop in the signal will be less than 0.1%. That's the precision of the wire, right? The quality management is done through IoT of that wire. It's very, it, the wires are used in watches, right? Uh, if you look at uh, one of the printer companies that I've worked with in the US, very interesting example. Like, you know people go and do maintenance, right, of printers. So this company, as usual, you know, sells printers and gives printers on rent. If you notice, the large industrial printers are on rent, on a lease basis. So suppose if you say this, this campus, you know, this uh, ITC hotel, say a printer company called X, will give five printers to this hotel on a lease basis. The more you print, the number of pages you print, the more you pay me, that's the idea, right? Now the important part over here is the printer should be up whenever the pr uh, print is required. Number two is it should be able to be serviceable and downturn should be minimum, right? So that's two criteria. So which creates a customer experience. Now half the time if the printer is down, you don't know what to do. Now there's something called uh, preventive maintenance. Every month an engineer comes and checks everything in the printer and says, okay, fine, it's working, okay? Now suppose there's a spool which is missing over there. Now, you don't know what to do with the spool. Again, the engineer goes back, comes, comes back, right? Now imagine, moving from a preventive to a predictive maintenance, that you can actually predict what is wrong with the printer. And likewise, the engineer comes with the necessary thing. He need not come every month, maybe he comes once in three months, but he knows what is happening with the printer. So two things very important, in a thing like printer in this large building, or maybe a bigger building like this, what you need is locational analytics where the printer is, and also that what are the, you know, the, the errors coming from the printer and the logs, which can be read remotely somewhere else, right? This is very easy because it's a static printer. Now imagine the printer is an aircraft or a train or a bus. You have printers on a bus or an aircraft, right? If they're on a scheduled flight, you can actually track them down that what is wrong. The train will st stop at this station and you can service the printer. So those are the levels of, you know, uh, I would say changes in business which is taking place. Now what it gives at the end of the day, for the customer it gives more, I would say, you know, uh, customer retention, customer experience, and new ways of doing business, right? The competition is not giving this. So this is bound to happen. Uh, another uh, in interesting, you know, factor would say like, you know, uh, currently they are, it's evolving, but still take the insurance sector, for example. Uh, very interestingly, we suppose I buy a car and he buys a car, say for example, a Sandro tomorrow morning. Okay, same model, same registration in Calcutta, right? One number after one number. We pay the same amount of insurance. After one year, he has driven one lakh kilometers, very, very rough driver. No, not actually, I'm just, <laughs> okay. And I'm a very good driver, I've just driven 4,000 kilometers, the car is absolutely like new. But what happens to the insurance after one year? It's nearly the same. Now, do you think it should be the same? What is insurance? Insurance is risk management, right? The risk on the rash driver is much, much higher. But all the information of the car can be actually collected on a real-time basis. And that can be actually analyzed. So this is usage-based insurance. Now, that data, what you actually get out of the IoT device installed in the car and taking a real-time data feedback. We have done such projects, you know, obviously, and it will come down to everywhere, you know, it's over here also there is, uh, Mahindra has started some good part with the, you know, location analytics of the car. Warranty management, which part of the car is not, is bound to fail in the next three months. And in that position, where is he, while going towards Diga, which is the nearest service center, where he can go to. So warranty management of the car. So. And that data of the rash driving can also be fed to the government, saying that 
you know, maybe his driving license next time should be controlled. And the other people who are driving better should be, you know, uh, acclaimed or should be supported. Uh, if you notice, there is another important things happening, like suppose today, uh, disruption in technology. Like, uh, if you notice the panels, solar panels, if you see in the Calcutta airport, they also put a lot of solar panels in Dubai because there's a lot of sun, they put it. And the solar panel, the energy that you actually absorb from the sun, you feed it back to the grid, right? You can't store it, you feed it back to the grid. Now, there are a lot of places in the world nowadays where actually the money is being given back to the consumer, which actually, you know, helps a lot uh, because sometimes if you notice that company like CSC may be challenged because if everyone has got a solar panel in the house and 10% of the people are actually getting money back from CSC, then it's a question of CSC's existence, right? Just to understand how things are changing. And these are all devices connected and, okay. Then uh, we, the IoT, if you notice, you know, it's actually associated with a lot of other things. Like for example, it's, it's a very large subject. One of the major subjects is going on, and I think, you know, uh, from manufacturing side, Germany is leading a lot, is the Indian, uh, the industrial IoT 4.0, you know, which is actually a consortium of people who are actually, you know, going together and, and creating a standard for IoT. Uh, and we think of, you know, robotics or an automation as a person, a, a physical, you know, a robot standing and walking with intelligence. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's just a pill. You take a pill and the pill actually, you know, does all the artificial intelligence to do whatever you want to do. Uh, the another important factor, which I think, you know, is, is very new, but I think it's getting discussed across the world, is uh, the IoT connected to medical devices, a medical booth facility. Now imagine if you can go or people can go to a medical booth like a, like a citizen services and actually get yourself completely scanned, checked everything, you know, remotely sitting at the booth and come back with all the reports. Because today with Aadhaar, uh, our identity is very, very clear, right? We know everything about that person. So it's not very difficult to kind of address that. Uh, so that might be one of the areas where we can utilize uh, for the healthcare systems. Uh, then imagine, you know, hotels, the experience, customer experience. Uh, lot of hotels nowadays today, you don't require a key. Before you can check into the hotel, you check in, go to the counter and check into the hotel. You don't need to check in. You just go straight to your room with your luggage. Your phone will function as a key and you can just put your phone, the door will open. If there's any restricted places like you're going to the pool or something where there's a card required, you don't need it. So these are all connected devices giving a better customer experience. You don't even need to go and pay the bill because your details are fed. So every time you go to a hotel, they say, give me your Aadhaar card, give me your identity, give me your passport, give me your you know, details or give me your driving license. It's not required because someone is actually tracking it already. It's not that it's required always. So in India also, it's nowadays those things are available today. You can check into the hotel, check out without any, anyone talking to you. And your bill will come on the you know, mail itself. Uh, so these are some of the areas where they thought you know, uh, that are interesting enough for the industry is changing. And we're also getting new insights into you know, what is happening across the world. Now important part to note over here, the IoT is a standard, it's evolving uh, continuously. But uh, because of the evolution, so there will be your competitions which will actually going, you know, a step ahead. So cost disruption will happen. There will be someone who's actually wanting to, you know, kind of uh, create like a Uber for the taxis, right? Today, if you notice, even the calculated taxis, long back, the way they used to behave with customers, today the way they behave with customers, very different because of pressure, right? The same thing has happened to Bombay autos, right? They used to, you know, immediately neglect going somewhere. But today, anywhere you go, they're ready to go because of the pressure of Ola's, the Ubers of the world. Now. The important part over here is to actually, you know, if you notice that IoT as a solution, it's actually got multiple number of operators across the world. There are, you know, registered operators for IoT. If you search the web, you'll find more than 300 operators. And it is not about one technology which is coming in. It's a platform created by multiple technologies. That is only one part. Then that platform needs to get integrated with the particular customer or the industry. And that has to get integrated with the other business processes, which requires a lot of SI activity over there. So that's why it's so critical that a vision is required to implement an IoT solution in a particular enterprise. Otherwise, it might be you know, not fulfilling enough. So it's not just I buy a product, install the product, I am become IoT. It's not that. So it, it cannot be like that. You know, there's a platform company, there's a SI company, there's an integration company. So oh, it's very, very important. It's a project completely, you know, which has to come from the senior management. That's what I want to share. Yeah, thank you, Dev. So, as you might have noticed, uh, he covered a lot of rewards, uh, including, you know, customer satisfaction, remote healthcare, quality management, and and that's really a that's really the driving factors why IoT is getting uh, prominence. 
Um, I will now request Kaushik uh, to give his speech and uh, uh, talk about uh, the risk and rewards. Yeah. So thank you, Atul, Somnath, and Dev for setting the stage. Now, um, they, uh, um, Somnath was mentioning DevCon. So as he was mentioning, there was an incident that came to my mind. It was about seven years back. You know, IoT was still, like there was no, the concept of IoT was still not there. At that time, I had taken, I had gone to this uh, DevCon, and I had signed up for, uh, you know, for a demonstration. Um, so basically, they will show, they will open my car remotely, and they will show me that how it works. It was a demonstration of wireless security, or rather, the lack of it. So I took the car. It was, you know, it was an, it was a good car. It may not be top of the line. It was a Honda, having decent security features in it. And I brought the car in front of them. They tinkered with their devices with about 40 seconds, and the car was open. They did not touch the car. They did not insert any devices in the car, nothing. They were working from, from about 40 feet away from the car. So wow, I was impressed. Uh, and then I asked them that, well, OK, so how can I fix it? Of course, I don't want my car to be stolen. So then he gave me some tips that, well, this is what you could do. This is a small device you could install in order to prevent that. These are the simple you know, behavioral um, practices that you could adopt. Um, to reduce the probability of having the car stolen. Fair enough. But then he also started saying, but by the way, even if you do that, I can still do this, this, and this technique, and I could still steal your car. I said, hold on, hold on. I mean, that's not what I was asking. What I'm asking is, tell me something like a foolproof methodology. I don't want my car stolen. Tell me something about that. So he said, he smiled and said that, well, I can steal your car any way if I want to. OK, so that was the answer. And I was, you know, I was like scratching my head. And uh, I thought that, well, OK, I mean, if that's the case, then what should I do? He said one very simple thing. He said, well, make your car less attractive for the thief to steal. So. If there are 10 cars you know, parked there, my car should be relatively less attractive and more difficult to steal. So that's the point. So overall, even before this advent of the IoT, this entire um, security thing, it has been like a Tom and Jerry, right? Um, Tom has been chasing Jerry, and Jerry has been fine. Sorry. Um, Tom has been chasing Jerry, and Jerry has been um, adept in finding new tricks. And Tom has been successful in some cases. Jerry has been successful in some. So that's why you find like once in a year, our computers, they get affected by some virus or the other. Right? We apply the patch, uh, go to the security desk, apply the patch, and well, we are all good, probably for a few months. We are used to it. We have lived with it. So that is what is a risk and reward. Reward will exist. Risk will exit, uh, exist. Sometimes risk will win over the reward, and then again the life will continue once we have applied the patch. So first of all, the message is there is no need to be scared. Even if there is IoT, even if risks increase, the rewards have also increased exponentially. So we got to take the risk, and we got to get a, reap the benefits of the rewards. So now the only question is that in IoT, it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, already, um, uh, Shantanu, Dev, and Atul has explained it, but I will explain it from a context of an automotive scenario. Automotive, you know, it has its expanses into the um, smarter cities also, as these connected cars are also um, connected to the smarter grid of the city, and they regulate transportation. So, so the, and, and also, we are working in a few projects in Europe in, uh, in actually implementing the connected cards. One of the connected cards, few of the connected cards are already rolled out in Sweden. So when we look at a connected car, 
And when we talk about it, we don't talk only about the car, like what was happening seven years back in DEF CON. Right now, we are talking about the phone, which probably opens my, my car, which probably will also give the address where I want to go from where I am. It is talking to the weather and finding out that, well, what is the weather situation from my origin to destination? And if there is an inclement weather, there is an ice deposited on the snow, then what is the detour I should take? Thirdly, that it also talks to is the communication grid of the city. Now, if it is found that there is a lot of congestion in one particular area, then there should be an automated rerouting mechanism. And it should avoid the, you know, the set of the standard route, take me into a route which is less congested, and imagine if it does for every cars like this, then automatically it will be less congested. We are probably, some of the cars are taking detour, going into a longer route, but it's decongesting the city. Fair enough. Now, what the, so what is happening in this process is, so you have the telecommunications part, you know, talking to the car. You have the uh, content providers, which are, you know, which can supply some videos or audios for entertainment to the cars. You have the hardware part manufacturers. You have the car manufacturers. You have the system integrator. So you now have a whole set of parties involved in making the connected car a reality with the smarter city grid. So yesterday, he was hacking my car, the wireless communication to my car's unlocking mechanism or the locking mechanism. Now, he has multiple entry points. He can hack my phone. He can hack my car. He can hack the SDP, you know, the software, the uh, delivery platform, software delivery platform to which every car is connected. So the overall intrusion points have increased. So in sense, right now, Jerry is difficult to find. Tom will have a hard time in finding Jerry. That is the essence of the problem. Now, if that is the essence of the problem, how do we arrive at a solution? There are various ways in which we can try to solve this. First is looking at the problems. The first problem was more devices. When it becomes more devices, and one of the esteemed panelists talk about it, the first thing that comes across is the quality of devices. You are buying a Samsung phone or Apple phone. Fair enough, it's of great quality. But if you are connected in a kind of a van network of phones, and if there are some phones which are of local manufacturers, you know, they are not of great quality, your link, the entire security, is as strong as the weakest link in the network. So right now the challenge is to ensure that all the devices in the IoT ecosystem has the same sort of security. The second is the kind of associated with the devices updates with respect to software and hardware. Not only the software updates needs to be periodic, which anyhow happens, but the hardware updates are also ne necessary because many of the recent you know, software breaches has happened because of the outdated hardware. Next thing, when we look at the privacy and the tracking, I think someone said it was probably Atul that, um, and I think Jaspreet was also talking about it um, before us, that, and Somnath also regarding the Fitbit. So as all these devices get connected, do we have any idea of how we are being tracked or how we could be tracked and how it affects the privacy? That's another aspect that comes to it. So what all this leads to is this, this entire IoT scenario will get transformed. And in order to find a solution, we may have to arrive at a situation where it is a scenario of machines versus machines. So tomorrow, what enterprises will do, they have to enable this automated security agents. Those will be run by you know, algorithms like deep reinforcement learning, which we work with you know, when we work with agents. And those deep reinforcement algorithms will tell us what is the right step to take in order to, fi autom in order to fight a hacker which is trying to exploit multiple loopholes in the system. Similarly, hackers also have a way. They might do you know, various kind of simulations and self-learning attacks in order to find the vulnerabilities of the network. Like 
you know, they might do something like a Monte Carlo simulation, which was existing, or even newer techniques like temporal difference methods they might use. So, in a sense, this is an still an evolving race. Um, but at the same time, the good thing is, you know, the machine learning and the machine versus machine part is still probably a bit farther away. Because if you look in a realistic way, what I need, if I need a machine learning algorithm to figure out where my vulnerabilities are, I need the data. And I need your logs. The logs are there in your security system. So I anyhow need to break into it. And if I, if I have broken into your security system, then I don't care. I don't care to get the logs. I will anyhow do what I want. So till the time, you know, the proper simulation softwares can be developed, which can actually generate those logs, and we can train our algorithms in that way, we are probably, we will see, you know, the majority of these security breaches in IoT are limited to more like human complacency or lag or failure to apply the right updates or even the device quality. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Koshik. Uh, thanks for this insight in the ping pong between risk and reward. Uh, and uh, hopefully, people will take it more seriously than they take Tom and Jerry. Okay. Uh, uh, last but not the least, to give you an end user perspective, uh, Sunil. Thank you, Atul. The clock is ticking. I'll keep it short and simple. Uh, the most important, I represent the retail industry. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is not about the security and all the stuff. I think more important for me is, I mean, the customer engagement and experience part. Now, you might wonder what is it about IOTs and the customer engagement and experience. What, what is he talking about? See, uh, today, today what is happening is uh, in retail industry, as we have started evolving, you see a lot of trends happening in the market. Uh, Amazon Go is one classic example. Uh, you know, uh, brick and mortar online channels trying to fight each other. So there is a lot of competition going on. So the only thing that can keep the consumer coming into the brick and mortar retail stores are, I think the most important thing is engagement and experience factor. Now, how do I link engagement and experience factor here? The most important, I think, what we are trying to do here is uh, get that experience part. Now, when I say experience, uh, it, it is all about personal personalization, you know, something called proximity marketing. I am sure you must have heard in tidbits about what is this proximity marketing all about. Just to give a small example, if a consumer or a customer walks into my store today, uh, he or she might be able to locate the product in his or her mobile. So this is the power of what we're talking about. So we, have, we, we are trying to get into the sensors and beacons of the world, placing it in proper shelves and you know, proper products. And the moment the consumer walks in, he or she knows what, where the products are, what type of deals are going on for that products, what is the promotion that are going for the products, and uh, you know, how, what is the current price, what, what is the selling price, all those details are available. This is one simple example of personalization. Second is the most important part for me, IoT, where it would play is uh, coming back to this RFID generation, you know, the supply chain thing. Now, the tracking of merchandise right from my supply chain, uh, which is my warehousing systems or right from my vendors, it's a big challenge today in retail. You know, assume that you are Pan-India, you've got 100 stores, different kinds of suppliers supplying the same products, the complexity increases. And this is where I think IoT is going to help us quite, quite strongly. Uh, third example I could relate more important is uh, uh, the self-checkout. Now, I mean, as I said, Amazon Go is one example, but India, we are trying ourselves something on the similar version called self-checkout or queue buster. Now, how does it work? The moment you are there in a queue, the third or the fourth person in the queue can be taken out and I can transact with that customer at that point of time. That could be a good example of queue buster using IoT technology. Uh, second thing, I can also develop an app, which is, which we, as we speak, you know, we are, we are trying to do that thing. It's an experimental POC thing that is going on, where I have given a SPAR app to my customers to download, and he or she can come down, directly scan the products, do that, put that into the cart, pay and walk off. Now, you might be wondering, this is, not, this is not India. Yes, this is happening in India, and IoT is being used. Uh, now, my major concern here is, as my esteemed panel has been speaking about, is uh, we, we are doing this. We are doing this for the sake because we need to do. Uh, there, there, is, there is no if and but choices here. Uh, but the most important thing is, as we do, we are not aware of the security risk that we are carrying. Uh, 
so it is because it is there is there is no policy formation policy formulation around it there is no dedicated guidelines around it when you when you explore the market you know there are a lot of options been given by the vendors i think this is where people like us or you know the end users are expecting the market to grow further much more dynamic in nature and much more matured in nature as we evolve uh, what i am trying to tell you in the last 10 minutes is technology is there there is a given use case studies that are that have been do, been done in the industries customers are willing to take those risk of going into those things and i think it's a matter of time when we scale it scale this up uh, only thing is and i think there is a proper regulation that is required for this entire setup i think that is where my request would go in that instead of talking of security at this first layer uh, we should have some kind of standard guidelines and policies and a you know a kind of architecture that comes out which can serve then different different industries because every industry has got its own requirement kind of thing thank you thank you sunil uh, that brings us to the individual presentations i think we are running out of time a little bit so i'll just open the floor for questions please identify yourself and the panelists you would like to ask your question to no questions Please. Can we have an explanation on the cloud system? Yes. Sorry? Yeah. There are companies moving into the cloud from main servers hardware. Here. On your left. So if you're planning to move to the cloud. So you'd like to know about the cloud ecosystem? Yeah. Uh, just because there is so much of vulnerability and so much of, uh, you know, this thing we have been shown. I just want to understand. Only for cost and space. Is it recommended that we move for cloud? Okay. Or we still be at home with our servers? Okay. Uh, who would you, who would like to? I mean, how secure it is, if it is at all. The security of the cloud, that's the, versus the cost uh, part cost, of it. Cost wise, see, I mean, security comes first. I will try to answer it uh, I, in, with my experience. So, journey to the cloud, if you notice, you know, firstly, you know, take a step back it's it's not an option some of the things we have to move to cloud because of cost reasons uh, if you don't move and try to create a perimeter in closing your business your business will actually go down because your competitions will come up and you will be totally out i mean you will not be able to respond as fast so as possible you mean to say this technology came into force mm -hmm. just for saving the industries from cost not exactly even usability if for example, Fine. if you're connected to the cloud, you can get your data anywhere. So that, that, that period of time, they have not taken care of the uh, security and vulnerability to the atmosphere? Correct. So security on the cloud is another option. I mean, say another di discussion altogether. Mm -hmm. But going to the cloud for a lot of applications, okay? Now, obviously, there will be some other applications like patient's data, okay? Then personal data of the banks, like you're connected to the banks, right? Now, if you notice, these data is actually getting shared somewhere in the cloud, right? Uh, maybe it's in Bombay or whatever, right? I'm just saying. But currently, yes, there is a lot of you know, control regulations on that, on how you should secure the data. But security on the cloud is one part. But moving to cloud and having those advantages are key. Like, for example, let me tell you. Uh, you would, sitting over here, you would like to know that if you're... I mean, if your manager is just sending you a mail or something, you know, which is so important, something is going to take place, right? You want to be informed, at least by an SMS or something. If you are a shop floor manager, if your systems are down, you want to know at 12 o'clock in the night that it's on or not. So if it is not well connected, you will not get that information. Your response will be lower. So going to the cloud in most of the areas is not an option, but a necessity, number one. Number two, what kind of data should move to cloud in what security parameters is governed by two things. One the general you know uh, rules and regulations of the country number one number two is actually you know uh, standard procedures and processes which actually needs to secure the data but again i'm telling you this is two different subjects altogether but some applications have to move to cloud there's no other alternative like today for example if i am sitting in calcutta my base is bombay and i want to know exactly what is happening to my business i need to send a report by five o'clock or have my people have sent the report or not it's a very important report i should be able to know just when i walk out say this so if it is not cloud enabled, I will not be able to access the data. So, sir, uh, <coughs> we work in an SAP environment and uh, we have our own database. So 
So my only question, I mean, that comes in my mind, whether we can have the database out in the cloud, I mean, is it recommended? Even if we have, even if you're planning to build an enterprise firewall. It, it is not a recommended or not recommended, it's a requirement of the business. See, I mean, one is an option that, okay, will I have, you know, this type of food or that type of food? Today it is not an option. I mean, talking the, from the security parameter, how security, security is very, very, yeah. So that, if it's a SAP application, I think it's better to speak to SAP because they will obviously want to secure their database. Okay. No doubt about it. Okay. But ideally, uh, your consultant for the security will actually advise you, plus the SAP people. I think that's a way to move forward. Thank you. All right, due to time limitations, we are unable to take any further questions. If you have any queries, please. Uh, can connect with us offline. And at this point of time, I would really like to thank all of the gentlemen present here and the dais for such an enriching uh, session. And may I now please uh, invite D.D. Purkaista, our Managing Director and CEO of ABP Private Limited and Chairman of Infocom to kindly present the mementos to all our speakers and the panelists. Can I have a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you so much, sir. Can you take your seats?